now. Detonate the reality bomb! I will build a great, great wall. Some alien race to come down and threaten us. Is the singularity near? The truth is out there. The military industrial complex. The seven mountains of the influencers of culture. To be as gods, you know. Change has come to America. Catapult of propaganda. From a secure location on top of the ridge in the heart of the beautiful Missouri Ozarks, this is a view from the bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. The shape of Moses' tabernacle may not be what you think it is. Welcome to A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. Joining me is a gentleman I first heard of about three, three and a half years ago. I noticed a story in Breaking Israel News, which is one of the websites I look at pretty regularly, uh, on a new theory about the shape of the Tabernacle of Moses. And if you've got a study Bible or if you've seen depictions of it, probably it is uh, depicted as a rectangle. And uh, I guess that's an assumption most of us would make. However, I am not an engineer, and our guest is. He is a professional engineer by training, has worked in a variety of industries, uh, as disparate as uh, food service, power generation, and then decided to study Hebrew in Israel, and then discovered that his study of Hebrew intersected with his professional training as an engineer. And uh, that has led to his new book, in which he proposes a new shape from the one you've probably seen for the Tabernacle of Moses. His book and teaching materials called The House of El Shaddai, his ministry, Project 314. And we'll have him explain that name here in just a moment. We welcome to the program for the first time, Andrew Hoy. Andrew, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Derek. I appreciate you reaching out to me. And uh, I was really surprised when you first sent an email um, and reminded me of the program where I had uh, mentioned on one of the daily updates for Skywatch TV, the story in Breaking Israel News. I had to go back and look at the YouTube video to remember <laughs> what it was that uh, had caught my eye. And that's, oh, yeah, OK, it's it's that um, I, I'm really intrigued by this and, and not being an engineer. You know, my sister is the engineer in the family. Actually, she's uh, inherited that gene, for, those genes from my father. Um, it, it It is intriguing but uh, probably there are engineers who might hear this who would have a really better graph and really appreciate the work and the detail you put into the book. But but first of all, the thing that struck me in in opening your your book and, and reading the early uh, you know chapters here is how you you realize that there was something different about the the shape of the tabernacle from the way it's typically depicted. Wh- what was it in the Bible? that led you to conclude that, hey, maybe we need to rethink what we know or what we think we know about the tabernacle. Yeah, um, well, it's kind of a a strange uh, series of events. I really didn't start out saying, hey, I'm going to study the tabernacle. Hey, I'm an engineer. I know better. Uh, I went into it, kind of uh, got into it by random uh, word search, more or less. And uh, that, that brought me to the beginning of Exodus 26, the word I was looking up in. I started looking at these these curtains, and it talks about the uh, you know the cherubim and the um, the, the different uh, loops and the sheets and all this kind of stuff and in the dimensions of them and the, the, and but it might have collected it and everything. So I was I was doing a little bit of you know curiosity, you know sidebar research on that. Again, really not saying, hey, I'm going to figure out the tabernacle. So um, I started looking at the curtains and the curtain descriptions. And, the, you know, there's dimensions. There's actually more uh, text uh, describing the curtains of the tabernacle. You know, you look at how much time is dedicated. No time. Uh, or, or given to the Ark of the Covenant, you know, this this holy, holy, great thing, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I started looking at the curtains and looking at all the dimensions. And because all the different uh, internet, I was looking on the internet, uh, different representations, how, how people had interpreted it and drawn it up, and they all conflict. You know, everyone thinks that the tabernacle design is, is, a, is a kind of a closed case where they got all the key things down. And the, the details between each design actually varies a great deal. And it's it's because they're they're working under the wrong paradigm. So to, to your original question, uh, I started looking at the curtains um, because the, the the dimensions are given, 
And I saw that the, the curtains, um, the second set of, of wool curtains, which is Exodus 26, uh, verse 7, starting there, the dimensions of them are uh, 30 long by, by 4 wide. And this is cubits. So from a, a practical standpoint, you know, figure a foot and a half to two feet per cubit about. And so, so that's, if you imagine a sheet of fabric that's eight foot wide, by 60 feet long. And this, this is a long strip, right? Mm-hmm. So they're told to make 11 of these pieces. And then after you make 11 of these pieces, you join them all together. Well, you join them all together uh, on the edges and, and you do that using loops that, that are described in, in Exodus. And so I'm looking at that and um, I have the, the numbers all on my spreadsheet and I had actually kind of physically depicted in my spreadsheet and I'm laying out, and I, I, I'm a, I'm a type of guy who also likes numerology. There's like uh, E.W. Bullinger number in scripture, you know, a hundred years ago. Oh, he, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. he, he wrote that talking about how different numbers relate to, you know, prophecy and, and typology and so forth. And, and so I'm, I'm kind of a numbers junkie like that. And so I, I'm putting the numbers out in, in a uh, laying, laying them out on the spreadsheet. And I take a look and uh, I see that the 30, you know, there's with the 30 in length, if, if you multiply that times 11, uh, that would be 330. And then it says in, in Exodus also to take uh, the, the 11th sheet, the last sheet, and fold it in half. Well, normally the, they, they put them together on the long edges instead of the short edges. And when they do that, they get this this large rectangular swatch of, of fabric, which, which measures uh, 44 cubits. You know, 4 times 11 is 44, mm-hmm. then by 30. So this is, this is kind of the, the swatch size that they make. You know, more like a, a Kleenex than a strip of toilet paper. So, I'm I'm looking at like a strip of toilet paper, where if you're if you're looking at the, uh, you know, the narrow narrow edge, it goes you unroll it and it goes you really you can get it as long as you want, kind of. I mean, within limits, obviously. But um, the the length then of of that uh, the, the other portion is is thirty. So. It had never occurred to anyone that I've ever seen to, to put the, the edges together differently. Uh, but I saw all those numbers kind of clustered together. And then, then it says to take take the last one and, and uh, the last sheet and fold it in half. I said, uh, wow, that's, that comes to 315. I said, that's kind of close to a multiple of, of pi. Mm-hmm. You know, so pi is, is the number for, for those who aren't math junkies. Pi is a number that, that describes the relationship between a circle's circumference and its diameter or you know the measure around it if you take a – a tape measure like uh, around a, a tree, a tree trunk, or, or around your waist, you know, that's your, your, your genes are, are going to describe the circumference of your waist. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, and the diameter is just like the, the straight through across uh, dimension. So that's, that's what pi is. It's a mathematical constant, never changes. And it's, um, it's been known for, you know, approximated for, for a few thousand years, but this is actually the, the most accurate uh, expression of it that, that I found here. So, so anyway, it was, it was 315, and I, I saw, like, wow, that's that's really close to the, to the pi constant. And then I took a look at, at the next uh, verse in, in Exodus, which uh, 2614, and it says, take a, a cubit from here and from there, or a little here, a little there type thing. And um, a, a, a cubit, you know, it's basically take another cubit away from that. And I saw that. I'm like, wow, if if we take 315 and we take the, the one last cubit from there, now we're at 314. I'm mm-hmm. like, that, that's a perfect multiple of pi. And I, I got this chill up my spine like like I had found something. I'm like, wow, this this looks like, uh, you know, this looks like a big hint. And I started pulling on that thread after I, I uh, made that discovery, and it just it kept on unraveling. So that's that's how I got into this. So 3.14, and you've got this multiple now where you've got 314 cubits. So rather than making a rectangle of these curtains around the outside, you're, you're basically said, okay, th- this is the starting point. What if then uh, this describes the circumference of a round tabernacle instead of a, uh, a rectangular one? Right, and, and there's there's other language in the text that points to it. Although I didn't I didn't see it re- immediately at the time. I started looking into it more, and uh, I've I've learned by by experience uh, from personal study and, and the other uh, book that I've written. As a rule, um, never trust an English Bible, and I, I know that's <laughs> going to come as a shock to a lot of your listeners. But once you start looking into the Hebrew and you know, dabbling in the Hebrew, I I, uh, 
I went to, to Israel specifically with the, the intent in mind to learn Hebrew. And uh, once you start looking at all of the, uh, the shortcomings and the non-equivalencies and so forth uh, from one, one text to the next, you just you roll your eyes and you shrug your shoulders and you just shake your head. You know, like, why? How, how could it have gotten to this? And, you know, it's not always the fault of the translators. It's, it's like an equal language thing. But uh, back, back to your uh, point on, on how this uh, courtyard is. Um, so it, it talks about using the the cut edges of the 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 uh, yeah, of these these sheets these uh, curtains and the curtains again they're these long uh, swatches and it says that to include loops on both sides of them. Mm-hmm. Well, if you have loops on both sides of every single curtain, that means that it's it's going to be either round, cylindrical, or or a polygon. Because if if I'm connecting, uh, if, if every single curtain is equipped. With uh, two edges that each each edge has uh, joints for connecting to an adjacent unit, that means it's circular. It means it's round. It's it's you're coming back to where you started there. So that that becomes a non-negotiable. Another thing in in Hebrew, um, you have the word uh, kaitsona. And uh, kaitsona, the uh, the root of that is uh, katsats or kites. You know, is where we get our English word cuts from. In all probability. And it's it's speaking of if you ever see fabric on a loom, you know, they, they weave the fabric back and forth and back and forth. Well, they, they start by taking the, the longer dimension and spanning it between two sticks, basically. And uh, at the end of the, the when you're all done weaving, you'd, you'd have the loops around the sticks uh, kind of remaining and you would you would cut there uh, to to, um, you know, to, to release your fabric from the or, or you could cut there or, or pull the sticks out. So. That would be the the cut edge, and the other edge is is not the cut edge. It's it's the the edge where it's it, it's kind of like seamless in that sense. Because every time that you shuttle the the fabric back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, you're you're looking at uh, it not cutting that. I mean that's that's just how how uh, weaving has worked for you know since since antiquity. So um, it, it actually does say which edges you're supposed to join and. The scholars have misinterpreted it. They've overlooked it. And another hint that gives it away is just to, to, to make this, this wool curtain set over the sides or upon the sides. Mm-hmm. And the way that it's translated in, in, into English from Hebrew, it's, it's always, it, it's usually like upon. You put it upon, uh, it, it says upon to tent on the tabernacle or upon uh, you know, being a tent on the tabernacle. So, the first ten sheets are actually described as, as the tabernacle, and then these the the wool sheets are actually to be put uh, upon. Uh, when I say upon, um, all is the uh, the Hebrew word uh, aleph lamed, which has to do with um, not only above but also the idea of over or around. And so we use these terms fairly interchangeably in, in English. Think of a shirt. If I have the shirt over my body, I'm not wearing it as a hat. Right. So mm-hmm. people get really hung up on prepositions in their Bibles, the way they're written, because they're trying to be literalists and they're trying to be true to the text. But they, they don't realize that there's there's always this this gap. And and, um, and so in, in Hebrew, it actually says to put these wool, that these wool curtains are going to be put uh, about, or upon the sides or over over the sides. And once you understand that's over the sides, now you've got a, a smaller um, a perimeter on the inside. And then the largest perimeter, which is this three one four dimension, pi on the outside. So that's that's a, again a few more tidbits of, mm-hmm. of hints on on you know that. So you, you open this up before by saying this is a theory, and uh, I I tend to challenge that that label and definition. I, mm-hmm. I call this a discovery as opposed to a theory. So ah, okay, it be, yeah, it began with a hypothesis and and that. It got amped into a theory, but now I, I I don't see why or or how it could not be you know accepted as as a as a true a, a truth and an absolute one at that. So, and I, I agree that uh, a lot of resistance to your your ideas uh, will come from people depending upon the English translation. Uh, instead of the underlying Hebrew, we, we run into some of that with uh, some of the things that uh, we, we have written and uh, d- discuss. Uh, for, for example, uh, the, the word G-O-D uh, has a definite meaning for most English-speaking Christians when, in fact, it is uh, 
uh, more a designator of place. Capital G God is not the same as small g God, but in the Bible, capital G God calls these fallen angels small g gods. And uh, yet people get hung up on that and uh, uh, assume that uh, when we talk about the divine council, we're somehow promoting polytheism, Um, a a word that might uh, be an issue for people in uh, analyzing your discovery, Andrew, is uh, the the round shape of the tabernacle is that uh, it is described in Exodus in English as having corners and sides, north, south, east, west. How do you reconcile that with uh, a round tabernacle. Yeah, that's a that's a wonderful question, and and that is is really uh, it speaks to the heart of the matter. This this problem and this question. Uh, let me go back to uh, the word sides for for sides. Uh, now in Exodus, I want to say it's uh, oh, it's in twenty six between eleven and thirteen. I think it's in in thirteen. Um, uh, off the top of my head, I'm not. I should have that open right now to be honest, but. Um, so the uh, that's the, the word uh, uh, tzadi is is there tzadi hamishkan and tzadi you can hear the word side mm. you know you have a s and a d in there so so those two those two um, uh, consonants have 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 remained apparently through the ages and again have leaked into our um, into our English and there's there's actually a lot of of English words where if if you're you don't have to be that creative in in um in exaggerating you you can see the parallels once you start building a Hebrew vocabulary and say hey wow uh, our English it seems to be rooted in the same you know in, in so, some of the some of the terms we use not all of them of course uh, are, are rooted in those same uh, phonics and so side is is one of them now if you take a look at uh, uh, Exodus twenty uh, Twenty six thirteen. Uh, you, so we're talking about taking a cubit for a little from here, a little from there, a little from this or that, a little on this side and a little on that side. That's what it's it's translated that way. I think in King James. So I'm not positive on the on the, uh, the King Jimmy there, but um, the 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 word there is zay, and it's uh, basically Zion hey, and and it's very um, that's like saying this or that or it. Okay, this is a. This is a, a pronoun that's that's used in in the most uh, general. You know, if I pick up something off the street, you know, something on the ground, a shoe could be an it, or a pencil could be an it. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that's that's the term. But they translated that that there as side, s i d e in English, and they actually do that with uh, a half a dozen words. I mean, they do way more throughout the entire Bible. If you, if you were to do a a King James concordance study and look up the word side. I've done that once before, and I think I don't know if I got uh, you know twenty or thirty different Hebrew words where they where they, at some point in time, you know. So so King James Concordance, if you run like a eSword program or something like that, you'll see uh, there is uh, you know the popular usages are, are put up top, you know, in the higher frequency, but then at the bottom they'll they'll start having the more off the wall translations, or it's like well, just in this one case, one time out of seven hundred. <laughs> it translated it this way, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and that's where you, you really have to raise an eyebrow when they start doing that as far as the fact that they've done it. But again, people have this 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 unprecedented, uh, relentless faith in in King James. And I, I get it. The fact that, you know, there's there's uh, arguably you could argue that it's better than a, a number of English translation, but they still want to they want to take it as been and like this divinely inspired writ and mm-hmm. and period in history and and this this uh, the authors. But you know, of, of course, in Deuteronomy it says you know this word do not add to it and don't subtract from it, and that's exactly what you do in translations. You, you see, like the the et in Hebrew, which is basically a pointing to the, the definite article um, or the, the pointing to an object, basically. Um, that doesn't exist in English. So what do you do in all those cases? Mm-hmm, well, mm-hmm. The, the rest of the syntax, so it's, it comes down to this, this non-equivalent syntax doesn't allow for a perfectly mechanical translation typically, uh, which is the, the mo- most, you know, absolute literal, I guess. So this is, this is the, the word side is, is one case where again, six different words I want to say in this, in this section and par- portion, uh, this, this partial of, of, uh, the Teruma Parsha, which is Exodus 25 through 27, which describes the furnishings and, and the tabernacle itself in the courtyard. 
they're um, they're they're just translating <laughs> everything into side when side is is not the best the best of uh, the selection of words and that they do that in in relative ignorance uh, because they're you know they they're they're starting with the wrong paradigm they're not paying attention they're not being uh, subservient to the word they're not being literalists in, in the most extreme sense that they could be um so so this is that's that's where all that tr- trickles down corners it's the same thing um so uh, can continue i guess is that, is that well no I no that, that that's is. fine that's fine um uh, and uh i i guess that that begs the question and where where did we get this idea where we we sort of take it as a given that the tabernacle is this you know rectangular shape how how did that develop why why has this not been challenged sooner well um let's go back looking at history and and the same way that 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 Christians I think put a disproportionate rever- reverence towards church fathers uh the same um of honor is given to Josephus. Uh, you know, Josephus accounts, it's like, oh, Josephus says X and Y and Z, so therefore X, Y, and Z, it, this is absolute truth, and, and uh, this is uh, uh, the same quality and caliber of Scripture. Well, if you write, if you read what Josephus wrote about the, the priestly garments, for example, you know, he's describing the, the priestly garments as he knows them or understands them. I'll go and compare that with Exodus um, I say it's twenty eight or something like that, where the garments are. Um, I'm not positive on that, but um, the uh, the garments are described differently, just slightly. Not there's not big gaping holes there. Um, so going back to the tabernacle, also, um, I'd like to make the point that it doesn't give you the final dimensions in Scripture. Mm-hmm. Uh, tr- tradition they they say, well, the holy of holies measures ten cubits by ten cubits. By ten cubits, look, it's a it's a perfect uh, a perfect uh, cube. They're like they're all wowed about that in the way that some of these dimensions lay out. There's sometimes in the text it gives you uh, dimensions, and sometimes it gives you weights, and sometimes it gives you none of that, neither. And you have to deduce where uh, what the lengths of certain parts are. Um, and this is this is one where the uh, oh, was I thinking? I lost my train of thought. On the weights and the lengths. Oh yeah. Um, so the the dimensions of of the boards, you know, they're 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 getting all these derived dimensions. So when you start doing your your math wrong, again, I can add, I can multiply four by eleven, or I can m- multiply thirty by eleven. Which am I supposed to do? And if you don't get your orientations right, well, yeah, you can come up with with uh, where everyone is getting the same answer. But if they're using the same uh, incorrect paradigm, so some of this I would attribute to idolatry. When I say idolatry, that is the idea of an image locked in the mind as as being, you know, put up higher than it, it should be. Um, where, where the text is a written word, and you know the Moses original writings were not illustrated, unless you want to consider that the Paleo Hebrew, the you know the old uh, the Protocanaic type. Uh, <laughs> of uh, the picture, you know, more pictorial. Ancient Hebrew look more like Egyptian hieroglyphs in certain respects, in that they're they're more uh, pic, uh, pictograms, and mm-hmm. uh, half of those half of those are, have anatomical human an- anatomy connections, but mm-hmm. um, or are, are representative, of course. But um, so this is the extent to which um, that the, this is tied into the tabernacle. I mean, as far as pictures, but you know, Moses didn't have an illustrator nearby, and he didn't he didn't draw that picture in your study Bible or in your in your antique one that you've had on the shelf with all these these etchings, you know, from 200 years ago. So once an image gets set in people's mind, they have a hard time shaking it. And Josephus actually gives dimensions of the tabernacle uh, construction as, as he understood it to be. And so, again, Josephus is much closer to, to the time of Moses than we are. So if, if he represents some of the uh, the earliest of Jewish writings on the on the um, on the custom on the tradition, well, then everyone says, "Well, of course, it's right because Josephus said it." Yeah, and but- they don't make a point of distinction between what Josephus believes and what Josephus knows. Well, and, and that's exactly exactly right. And, and not thinking through that, uh, the tabernacle hadn't really been used or seen since the time of uh, Solomon when he built the temple. So Josephus, right. you know, was writing almost a thousand years later. Right, um, right. I mean, it, that would be like us. 
today in uh, 2020, assuming that we could write, uh, say, a history of uh, the Battle of Hastings without actually visiting the battlefield or, or having any you know knowledge of uh, uh, of the history, just you know oral tradition. Um, sure. So you know, it just and then and somebody two thousand years from now saying that well because uh, Derek Gilbert lived in twenty twenty he must know what William the Conqueror was like. Uh, right. No, not quite. Um, the the uh, getting getting to one of the engineering questions here. Uh, and when when people look at, I'll, I'll put an image of the book cover uh, it, it, with the uh, the notes at uh, vftb.net, so you'll you'll get a sense of what I'm what I'm asking here and why I'm asking because the sh- the shape that you propose then, based on beginning with the the discovery of pi in uh, Exodus 26, and, and then working from that, and then challenging the assumptions that we've had, uh, which may date all the way back to Josephus. Um, you come up with a essentially a uh, a dome that is considerably larger than the uh, the tabernacle that uh, we see in our study bibles the drawings of the tabernacles that we see in our study bibles um from an engineering standpoint as this tabernacle was used and moved around with the israelites in the wilderness uh what would be the advantages of this shape over the uh, the kind of boxy rectangle that most of us thought was the shape of the tabernacle sure um that's a a mouthful here um the (laughs) uh, the, (laughs) the, um everyone knows like the billboards by the side of the road when you when you have a lot of wind on them you know that you have to put a lot of reinforcement a a dome is is naturally uh wind shedding and um it's it becomes regardless of the direction of the wind it becomes equally loaded in any direction and so uh, there's there's certain structural advantages. Now let's just say, um, and and I have this on my website on my the front page is kind of the idea that you do not have to be an engineer to apply common sense. Uh, <laughs> most people who who've been camping uh, would would know like okay, how do we um, uh, what do we like for camping? Um, when you put your tent in, in your in your car for camping, you want to fit it in your trunk. You don't want to have a trailer, um, you know. Uh, Two and a half times the the length of your standard car have to be towing it around with a dually, uh, you know, dually pickup with the four wheels and back and all that. You know, you're trying the objective of a tent in any culture in the world is to take the least amount of framing material and span the most amount of fabric. Mm -hmm. Right. It's it's all about about weight and and um, uh, what I say between you know weight and and coverage. You know, you're you're trying to get as much coverage you can with as little weight of lugging around as you can, where it still stands up and is all safe and stable, right? So compare this to the shoebox, uh, as I refer to it, the rectangular model. Uh, you could use saltine cracker box or Winnebago if you like. That's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> those, those, I haven't trademarked those terms. Um, the, um, the idea that, that they have all these, these big standing beams, all these vertical standing beams that are, uh, it, it basically makes something like a, a footprint that is just enormous as far as the amount of weight per square feet that you have, the, the way that they're doing it. You know, no, no engineer in right, their right mind and throughout history would, would do that. And, and you see, this is what makes the, the Exodus Tabernacle so unique. And then I think to that, uh, or the, the shoebox thing, it's perceived as holy because it's so bizarre. And, um, you know, people have reverence for that, which is, uh, curious and and that, which is bizarre. So, um, think of it when you're even building a house, what do you do with it, with your house, the walls, you're putting out the, the drywall, you're putting it on, onto studs. You have these studs that are spaced apart. You don't, you don't stack the studs one to the next, a two by four, right next to a two by four, next to another two by four. And Mm -hmm. you don't build a whole wall by stacking two by fours vertically. I mean, the notion is preposterous. It's it's so absurd that you know I'm just stunned that um, it, it seems that no one's no one's discovered this or considered this for for a long time. Especially if you look at all the indigenous structures. You know how are the Eskimo, even Eskimos build. Um, um, oh, they're uh, igloos. Yeah, you know, build. You know, in in igloo, actually, um, uh, Avi Ben Mordecai. Um, uh, he he sent me this this um, material on, on the, the 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 Hebrew word for tent is ohel, 
and the um, it's spelled Aleph Hey Lamed, and um, basically the, this is uh, some more of this Edenics concept, which is uh, I'm going to say Isaac Mosen was is the guy who who uh, who's written a whole book on this this topic where um, the 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 Hey in um, as it's transferred through different cultures and, and eras and everything became more guttural. And so Egel, you know, instead of Ohel, it's uh, and, and the again the consonants. I'm sorry, the vowels will vary between e and a uh and o uh, mm-hmm. or, or what have you. So Eglu, Egel, you know, so you can hear the Egel, and so huh. you can you can he- see or hear how Ohel actually became Eglu, hmm. and um, the 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 notion that. Um, uh, you know, all the different indigenous people, the, the Native Americans, earth lodges and so forth. I mean, there's a lot of uh, construction similarities uh, between that and the original uh, tabernacle. So, uh, and this is, in my opinion, this is the Rosetta Stone of, of a lot of different Bible prophecy and ar- uh, architectural history in a sense. And, and um, you know, it, there's, there's, there's a lot to it. Um, you know, I was mentioning the paleo paleo Hebrew, you know, how the, the ancient letters uh, represented, you know, human anatomy. And um, I guess this is the other thing I was uh, trying to come back around to is uh, when you were doing that, that commentary on breaking Israel news, uh, you, you're talking about the mountain of the Lord, right? Right. right. Um, yeah. And that's one and, of the things I wanted you, to make sure that we got into because my first book was all yeah. about the importance of sacred mountains throughout history uh, and of course, Zion being the most important one, because that is the Mount of Assembly, the Har Moed, uh, which is the Hebrew behind the the phrase that was transliterated into Greek and into English as Armageddon. Uh, right, yeah. But it, it struck me in seeing this that, yeah, this looks a lot more like a mountain, which is what all of these, uh, where, where so many of these spiritual encounters took place. Even Babel, which is in southeast Iraq, Babel was an artificial mountain. But then you've got Zion, you've got Sinai, you've got uh, Mount Hermon, where the watchers descended and uh, where Jesus was transfigured into a being of light. Uh, Mount Zaphon, which was the mountain where everyone knew Baal's palace was located. It became so important in Hebrew that the compass point north is Zaphon. Zaphon. Right. Yeah. Where in other Semitic languages, it was it's uh, Samal. It's a d- different mm. word because Mount Zephon was the the place where Baal was located. That's where the cosmic enemy was located. Mm. Um, I, Interesting. I, in fact, I would even argue that that's where uh, Gog of Magog or the Antichrist will emerge. But the, well, Ezekiel makes it clear that that's where Gog will uh, marshal his forces. But uh, anyway, it, it struck me that the, 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 the tabernacle as a representation of Eden which was the original mountain, according to Ezekiel 28, would look more like your conception of the tabernacle than, than what we've been seeing in our Bible all these years. Yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's just so much depth to it. To, um, going back to your, your a mountain of, of uh, yod heh vav hey, mountain of the Lord, mm-hmm. um, th- that, you, you, were, you were the first person um, to, to point that out. And I don't, I don't think that I had fully... Um, stop to ponder the implications of this thing. You know, everyone thinks that Mount Zion is just a place upon which the temple was built. Uh, and rather than considering the possibility that Mount Zion could have been referring to the structure itself. So you, you recall that you, you're generally not supposed to uh, put the tabernacle up on, on, on the high places, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So this thing here. It's it's still the mound of of Yod Hey Vav Hey of uh, the mound of of the Lord, um, so that's that's what it is. And so w- when I was listening to your, uh, I'm like, oh wow, this is this is neat that someone else is is pulling out another dimension of it and everything. So you know that, um, that really, I mean, uh, I'm. I was going to say that that adds another dimension ahead. to the understanding of the the layout of uh, Shiloh. Because when we visited Shiloh the last two years on our tour of Israel, we found that the the probable location of the tabernacle at Shiloh was not on the highest hill. It was basically surrounded by hills where people could look down on the tabernacle. The tribes could basically gather and see the tabernacle. Uh, And even in Jerusalem, it's the same thing. Because Zion, Mount Moriah, is not the highest point. The western hill is higher. Uh, Mount Scopus is higher. The Mount of Olives is higher. Uh, I, I met a missionary in in Jerusalem, or not in Jerusalem, uh, in, in Haifa. When I was, yeah, uh, he's an Australian guy named Jeff, and, and Jeff said uh, 
to Ah Jerusalem and Bell smells incense and nonsense because there's <laughs> there's there's so much you know ridiculous lore that um, it it sometimes outweighs the truth. It, it wasn't even saying that Jerusalem is not a holy place. Um, that was not his intention. But um, but you you see all the you know the the gimmicks and so forth and and it, yeah it's uh, uh, with Shiloh I think that's the case. You have you have more lore there than there is you know, serious, uh, you know, objectivity in some of these things. So, um, I, I visited Shiloh uh, on a couple of occasions and, you know, they say, well, well you know, people have said, oh, what about Shiloh? You know, they think that Shiloh is just this grand proof of it being rectangular. And it's like what they found a bunch of rocks, you know, they found, mm-hmm. and, and there's this one thing they think it's, it's one of the holes, the post holes where they, they put the tabernacle, uh, the, the curtains, the posts, and there's a number of different uh, traditions you know, related to the Mishnah and, and all this. But um, long story short, they, they think that the original uh, tent walls were, you know, were, um, well, some say they're reinforced. Some say that they're, um, that they use the original, you know, fabrics or tabernacle parts. And, and if they did that, that this, this hole, you know, they have what they, it, it appears to be more like a post hole. You know, if you think of a post hole digger and, and, you know, four by four uh, deck post or, or mailbox post or, or what have you. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's that's a very large thing. Now, you're not given any wood in, in Exodus 27 to make a courtyard post. You're given copper. Okay, so the copper is, is your specified material. So if the Bible says let's use copper, then hey, how about this for an idea? Let's use copper. Mm-hmm. And, and almost all of the rectangular representations show a bunch of wood posts around it. Right, I right. Mean, it's just sloppy, sloppy scholarship, and, and, and a lot of it's just held. Um, and and it, it, the, it's a long story short, at Shiloh, I'm sorry, but that, that the hole that they have in the ground where they, you know, hold in the de- bedrock to hold up the, the, the curtain of the tabernacle, it's, it's so absurd that uh, words can't describe the, the size. You know, they weren't given a fraction of that copper. Um, they're, they're just terrible at, at material m- measurement and, and monitoring. So, mm. I, I we're going to run out of time here before we really dig a whole lot deeper into this. Uh, but I kind of expected that to really don't just scratch the surface. And hopefully, this will get uh, people curious enough about uh, your theory to go to your website, which I should have mentioned right up front project314.org. And of course, that link will be in the notes. Below this uh, audio, if you're watching this at YouTube, well, I mean, you're watching a still image at YouTube, but still, uh, you'll find it in the uh, the notes below. Um, the, a, a, as we approach <laughs> a, a time, with, I mean, it's almost it seems unprecedented to us because we've got a very short uh, sense of history. Uh, I think people 100 years ago would probably, uh, having lived through the Spanish flu, would say that what we're going through right now is really not anything compared to then because at the same time the spanish flu was going through uh the uh, was go- going around the world world war one was also uh, killing tens of millions of people um but it, it does seem that uh, we are much closer to the end than to the beginning um what is the connection between the the design of the tabernacle and 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 your discovery if any with um the the unfolding of prophecy. I mean, it, it, what what do we make of this? It, has this information been discovered now at this time for a specific purpose? I mean, are, are, is this part of the the knowledge that's increasing per uh, the the prophecy of Daniel? I, I do I do believe that you know uh, um, you you you, you, <laughs> you got to. Uh, a multifaceted uh, question statement combination there again. But, um, and yeah, it, I'm, it I'm sends, good at that. It sends, it sends my brain in about a half dozen different directions. I'm like, I want to get this and that and the other thing. Um, so I'll, I'll bring back a case in point, you know, with, with David, King David, what did he do? He, um, uh, the, the plague was stopped uh, by, by him sacrificing mm-hmm. at, uh, you know, and the, the temple Mount. Now yeah. at, the, at the time, the temple Mount, what is the Temple Mount? Guess what? It's a threshing floor. What's a threshing floor? Well, it's, it's where animals walk uh, and trample grain. They're, they're tethered to a stake in the center, and they go, what, around and around and around and around. So yeah, this, yeah. this place, place where David did that was a threshing floor. You know, this is another kind of a big hint. So if let, we're, let, we're let talking me, about – I hate to interrupt, but I have to interject here just to brag on my wife for a minute. In the book that we just wrote, uh, Veneration, she wrote a couple of chapters on threshing floors because there's 
that there are references in Canaanite texts, the, the Rephaim text from ancient Ugarit that talk about them uh, being summoned to the threshing floor of El, which was their creator God. Uh, and we show from peer reviewed academic papers on this that, uh, that referred to Mount Hermon. Um, so you've got the idea of the threshing floor as a place where the dead, the Rephaim, were summoned to meet with their God, where they believed they would be revivified or resurrected. And here on Mount Moriah, you've got David at the threshing floor of Arana, spotting, you know, basically interceding and, and, the, and, and Yahweh uh, saying, okay, the angel will stop at this point. Uh, again, it's it's like a point of contact between this world and the next, or portal, if you want to use that word. But Sharon pointed something out that I'd never thought of either, and you I, you in, it's pretty plain in the the image that you include in this section in your book, the House of El Shaddai. It looks like crop circles. <laughs> I mean, not to get weird, but it it is a a it's a striking image, and it's like yeah, that does kind of look like what the uh you know the the true believers in the ufo phenomenon are putting forward as what they think their point of contact is between uh you know us and you know our space brothers which i think is a deception from uh the fallen realm but it, it is intriguing that you've got these connections that uh, i i think most people have overlooked uh and well, the- uh, coming together in, in in your book and your your concept here conception of the uh the shape of the tabernacle yeah, the, the the crop circle thing I actually had on my website. Uh, it was on an old article. I I need to migrate it to to the new site here yet. But um, there's there is one crop circle that that um, that is a mathematical expression of pi. It's a very interesting expression. Wow. Um, but but getting into the crop circle phenomenon, um, I I kind of looked into that years ago, and I recall. Um, you know what what they find in in these things. So these these aren't a bunch of guys running around on boards, you know, trampling uh, down grain under with, uh, underfoot, because the, the way that the stalks are bent over, you know, it's only the wheat. And, and what happens? The wheat bows. Okay. And so what's what do you have standing? Uh, the weeds are left standing in these things. Oh, interesting. Which is kind of an ear. Yeah, yeah. So the the, the name for it is cereal. Cereology, like cereal, you know, like Cheerios, or mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and and the Cheerios, of course, are round. But um, the, but seriously, the 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 notion, uh, Peter, um, see, Satan is asked to, to sift you like wheat. Yeah, right. So you've got the grain offerings going, and even uh, Goran is is uh, is the threshing floor. I, I'm I'm not sure I got the vowels right in the Hebrew, but G R N Gimel uh, Resh Nun is is the root for for that, and the, the um. You know, making reference to to the the gate also is another reference to wheat. So, you know, the, this idea of the the wheat sacrifice and, and or the grain offering rather, and how this ties into first fruits. Um, uh, so, the the first uh, of Aviv, which is the first month of the Hebrew year, this is the mm-hmm. day upon which they erected the tabernacle, which would have been at the uh, I would argue the equinox period. And I, I think that this this uh, the structure itself is actually a um, prophetic timepiece is what I believe. It's the Ohel Moed. So people are familiar with the Moedim, the Moed, uh, their feasts, mm-hmm, the feast mm-hmm. of the Lord. It's, it's the Moed. And so in, in the beginning of Genesis, it uh, talks about how he made the si- sun, moon, and stars as, you know, for Moed for the for the, the, the appointed times, right? So if we have this concept that this is the tent, not just the tent of meeting, it's the t- tent of appointed times. I believe this was used as a timepiece, and I've got an article, I don't know, 10, 10 12 pages that I've written on that. Um, again, that's a little lagging on, on getting into my website, but um, and that's that's on, on me. I, I've uh, oh, it's just I, there's a lot of different different directions I've been trying to um, trying to get the because there's just so many so many dimensions to this. Again, the, the mm-hmm. anatomical, the prophetic, uh, the number of pieces of silver, if you count in the right way. Uh, there's 144, um, hmm. as, as I recall, um, and and this you cannot get out of the shoebox model because they're double counting parts and they're they're not interpreting the pre- uh, the um, uh, the text right. I compare this to like a big game of Simon Says, and it's this is ex- ex- uh, an excerpt of of a, a six chapter spread where it's thus saith the Lord, you know A B C D E F G H, you know, and um, you know, he's not skipping letters. He's, he's not writing slop. You know, the, the, the text is very purposeful. 
very uh, literal, very uh, direct, and very pointed, and very efficient. It is so efficient that within, uh, uh, you know, probably, I don't know, 500 words or less, um, you have a description of, a, of what I believe to be a, a six-story tent. Hmm. And not only just the description, it's, it's the plans on how to make it. But, but you have to pay attention. You have to do what it says. So, you know, with, with the discovery of this at this time, and again, I, I uh, you said theory, and again, I'll, I, I, don't, I, can, I can understand what, where people would say theory and, and re- regardless because they haven't tested it out. And so, you know, I'm, I'm going to be probably about the only one who's going to say, no, it's a discovery. <laughs> and so I'll just keep doing that because it's fun. Well, forgive me. Um, I, t- I tried to say, I tried to remember to say I, concept instead of uh, theory. Yeah, but, uh, no, that, uh, that's okay. I mean, it, it is a theory. You know, there's a truth. Uh, just because it's a theory doesn't mean that it has flaws. Uh, it it means that it may not have been proven mm-hmm. um, or proven in full. But it, it a theory is something that explains things. And so it's not c- incorrect to call it a theory. But there's there's a point in time where you you graduate from that as well. So. Mm. Um, that's, that's my only point. But anyway, I, uh, this is why I'm so intent on this saying, Hey, this is a discovery. And, and with it being a discovery, what are the, what are the implications for our time? I mean, I'm of the opinion that uh, it's, it's a good thing to rebuild this. And, uh, you know, everyone's expecting the temple to be, you know, the end all be all, um, the thing that we should be you know watching for looking for. Well, what does it say in Ecclesiastes? There's nothing new under the sun that which is, has been, it will be again. And if that's the case, uh, I, I also believe that you know, we're if if we're upon the end of days, we're we're, we're looking at the the time of the, the regathering of the lost tribes, and you mentioned Daniel, the people going to and fro, knowledge being increased. Mm-hmm. Um, this is this is knowledge being increased, and it talks in, in Zephaniah, and this is the only text that uh, it has uh, every Hebrew letter, including the Sophets, and the Sophets weren't used in the time of Moses, or at least. Uh, some people say they they may have been, but um, but traditionally they're not represented that way. But e- even the sophists, and uh, I want to say it's Zephaniah three eight and three nine, um, and it talks about returning the people to to uh, the holy tongue, you know, and where they can serve the Lord with one consent. And the reason everyone's bickering in the theological, the reason we have all these these denominational divisions is because everyone's. You're, you're running on a broken language. You know, we understand what happened at the Tower of Babel. Oh, he came down and he did what? He confused their languages. Well, which language did he not confuse? Mm. Uh, I personally mm-hmm. believe that language is Hebrew. And I believe that it, that's the divinely inspired stuff that, that we need to get mastery of first. And, and until then, you know, we can we can argue our, our favorite translations to we're blue in the face. And and you might not even come close to hitting the side of the barn. And, and that this is... <laughs> this is ironic. I was saying the word barn because the, the shoebox model looks much more like a barn and, and <laughs> you, you're not hitting the sides of it because because it's got seven words, six, seven words that are being used, translated as sides when mm-hmm. they're not supposed to. <laughs> it's, it's that sort of thing. So um, so this I think for our time right now, you know, this is important. It, it's also important because, you know, is is, uh, you know. Is it important the whole "thus saith the Lord" thing? You know, why should we build like this? Oh, because He said so. Mm-hmm, People will put mm-hmm. you know millions of dollars into extravagant churches. Did He ever say go build a church? Did He ever say build it this way? I tell you, this is the only thing in the Bible, with the exception of Noah's Ark, which He said this is a one timer, right? He said that of Noah's Ark. He didn't say that of the tabernacle. But the temple comes along, and, and uh, you know everyone just assumes that oh, the temple is better. Because it's worth more money, um, so the temple is, is about 150 billion dollars worth of of uh, you know capital and, and uh, investment and so forth. That's enough to to put up two NFL football stadiums in every state of the union, or take the five least populous states in the U.S. and, and build everyone every family a new home. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's the amount of money that David put into this thing. And so, yeah, it, it's it's understood to be great, you know, great as far as big. But look at the response that Nathan said. You know, when did I ever say to the the guy who's shepherding my people Israel, you know, build me a house of cedar? This is this is no, this is you know this is antithetical to to then make the the temple after that was the divine response. He says, I've been I've been cruising around with a tent as, as my dwelling. 
you know, it, it sounds from that text, it's like, well, he sounded pretty happy with the instructions that he had given. So why would we want to then deviate from those instructions? Why would we not want to return back to them? And, and you know, even you know, the, the word repent in, in English, um, you know, we, we say re- repent, teshuva is the, the Hebrew equivalent of that. And that idea, you know, people think of repent as just stopping doing evil. Well, it's not just stopping doing evil, it's returning back, re- revolving back to where you, your point of origin, where you're supposed to be. Well, if this is described in the Torah, and, and the Torah is, is, is this, you know, mosaic thing where it's the most important, um, uh, you know, if, if Moses was the greatest of all the prophets, and he had this revelation, there's, there's 50 ch- uh, chapters of text that's making reference to this uh, this tabernacle, and not just Moses, but throughout the Bible. And so, why is it then that we've deemed it to be unimportant? And I think that the answer to that is is rooted into the etymology and the, the junky, janky shoebox version. People don't understand that it was 480 years mm-hmm. after after um, coming out of Egypt when Solomon built the tent. Well, when Solomon um, or when he built the temple, when he when he built the temple, he also had the, the tabernacle decommissioned. Right. So, um, you know, I think this is another, you know, prophetic uh, hint and, and wink and nod of, of what will ha- happen again in the, in the future. And I think I think Solomon's a picture of Antichrist, but that's a whole nother uh, story. Uh, you know, it's, uh, um, we've discussed that on this know, program six- before. So, yeah, that's not a new idea for yeah. listeners to uh, this program. Yeah, I think was it were you with Mark Biltz with that? Uh, um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I I, I I saw part of that. So yeah, I, I had come to that conclusion independently uh, before. Uh, you know, I heard of that, or thought of that a number of years but ago. And the- Solomon was the one who led the the rabbis and the uh, the, the uh, priests to refer to the southern end of the Mount of Olives as the Mount of Corruption because he built the temples up there, or the uh, the altars for uh, Baal and Molech and Astarte. Ah. Yeah, so. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, um, interesting thought that uh, perhaps it won't be a temple, a third temple that would be built uh, to restart the uh, the sacrifices, which we assume will happen at some point because prophetically the uh, Antichrist, the man of sin, will put a stop to the uh, sacrifices and oblations. Um, but what if it's a tabernacle instead? Hmm. Well, it, and I don't. Um, I don't see the tabernacle as, as being part of that 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 stop and that upset necessarily. I, I guess I would, um, I, I don't know. I've, I've looked at that text in Daniel, and it, it seems to be um, using a lot of, uh, I guess, speaking in terms of hints and, and arguably slang, or, or um, you know, it, there's a little bit of a of a gapping between that and the, and the Torah as far as how things are described as being. Uh, you know, at that time are restored. So really what's going on there, I, I'm, I, I'm undecided, I guess, is, hmm. is where I'm at. But there's there's the assumption that it, it talks about the holy place. And, you know, I think uh, Mikdash is, is in there. And, and so what do they usually call the the, uh, the temple? Beta, Beta Mikdash, you know, the, the, the house of the holy, or the holy house. Um, and so the, the Mishkan is, is – the, the, which is a tabernacle, and um, and th- this is where I was going before with this idea of taberna. Uh, that's a Latin root for this. Is where we get our English word tavern from, you know, which is a, a dark and, and weird place, right? Uh-huh, it's yeah. um, you know, it's just not usually thought of as a holy place. Right? Different connotation, right? Um, right, and, and and but getting into this, the image that 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 term puts into your head when I say tabernacle, an image pops in your your brain, and it's it's probably not this thing of of Moses. You know this um, the, the the concept of of what was described in in Exodus. It's not that, and so everyone when when I bring up the word tabernacle, hey, I've discovered the tabernacle. Then the, then his shoulders shrug and they say, uh uh-huh, it didn't really matter because you know we have that we've had those better temples, and now we have Jesus, and and now um, you know there's he's dwelling inside of me and everything. But this is. Um, the guy who who built this, or the architect for it, who's working under Moses, his name is Betzalel, mm-hmm. and uh, the Hebrew word Betzalel, um, you, you can parse it a number, of, uh, a couple different ways. One is that the Bet is is a house, and the word Saul is image, and then L, so it's house in the image of L. Right. So if you say that God's image is not important, well, then this isn't either, right? Hmm. But if you say that God's image is important, well, then suddenly this becomes of extreme importance. 
And I'm I'm stunned that the the the, the church and and arguably the, the the Jews as well, the synagogues haven't haven't taken uh, you know great great interest in this. And it's again because of that that I think it's because the wrong association is so strong and powerful, and that influence and. In, and the, the mistranslation side is as well, um, you know. But when I was in Israel, I could take a uh, four-page drawing set where I had this reduced to two, and I could say, "Tire uh, yeshpo you know, I could I could say, you know, look at this. Um, uh, these are the curtains. These are this, and a lot of these Jews who had the, the Torah memorized practically, or at least this parsha it seemed. Um, they followed along. I was able to, to explain this in five minutes to, to most of them and, and mm-hmm. by, on a, on a per component basis. And there's just a lot of like, you know, nodding of heads. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a little harder with an English audience because there's, there's so much translation barrier, but usually if I'm doing a presentation, I can get a 95% conversion rate. Uh, but they, they have a hard time retaining it because there's a lot of detail to this mm-hmm. and, no one, no one ever envisioned a lot of this detail being important. If you look at uh, Ramban's uh, art scroll content, uh, he doesn't even comment on any of the uh, uh, of the curtains. You know, it's it's thirteen verses, no comment. Hmm. Oh, hmm. okay. <laughs> Why? Because this is all unimportant. Yeah. And yeah. then they start then they start arguing about how the frame is built. You know, the specifics of the frame, and it's like <laughs> y- you you've already missed the boat because you didn't start at the beginning. You know, and sadly for most of us, uh, that section of Exodus is one of those that we kind of skip past. Okay, boring, 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 boring. You know, let's get back to the right. wars. And uh, right, but but it, you know, you're I, right. I had no interest in it before before I stumbled upon this. I had I had zero interest, and it, it's it's like the you mentioned the big, uh, boring parts of the Bible, like the begatting. You know, such and such begat such right, and right. such begat such and such. And there was he brought twelve goats and and you know one hundred twenty lambs. And, you know. Nobody, nobody reads that with any intention, and mm-hmm. there's always stuff there if if you look for it. I mean, you always be surprised, but we're looking in the wrong language. So, absolutely, and that's again total agreement there. Um, I I will say for listeners that uh, this book is heavily illustrated in very detailed illustrations, so that you don't need to be an engineer to understand Andrew's uh, case as he lays it out and uh, lays it out with great detail and explains exactly why. Uh, from an engineering perspective, the the design that most of us are familiar with just doesn't make any sense. Uh, it's structurally unsound. It would have led to uh, the the skins used to cover the tabernacle essentially rotting away because they weren't getting enough air to dry out. Uh, j- just many, many details here that uh, make more sense when you envision it and, and start with the correct premise, which is that the uh, uh, the the. 11 uh, curtains were supposed to be connected end to end and not side to side. And then seeing the connection there with uh, the length of those uh, sides as they're connected and uh, the, the value of pi, which describes the circumference of a circle. Uh, the book is the house of El Shaddai, God's dwelling place reconsidered. He's also put together a, a, a presentation and I appreciate you sending that CD ROM to me to uh, look at as well. Uh, which, again, if you're not an engineer, but you are visual, you can see the case as he makes it. Uh, it's at the website, uh, project314.org. Uh, Andrew, is that the best place for people to get a copy of your book? Yes, uh, they could do that. And they could also go to Amazon if they're uh, partial to that. Um, but uh, the uh, just just uh, for clarification uh, with the book and, and also the presentation, the, the PowerPoint presentation, uh, I also dismantle the the old structure and the old system. So I'm mm-hmm. I'm starting from a common point of reference. It's like, okay, well, this is what you know, or this is what you think you know. This is what you're familiar with. These are the shapes. This is the arrangement, uh, and so forth. And and a lot of that detail that I go into, um, if if you buy uh, um, the different products, you know, Rose uh, Rose is a uh, Hendrix and Rose is a famous. Uh, you know, source for that material as well as uh, Art Scroll. You can start with with some of those other sources, and they don't go into near the detail. I, I go into more detail on the broken model than either of them do. Mm-hmm, I think, mm-hmm. and and um, it's because I've I've looked at all the different you know uh, models. They've got a, a preferred you know broken arrangement that they like, and and they, they vary some, like I said. But I, I make a point to take which is familiar. 
Uh, you don't need to know Hebrew for this book. Um, I do have another book in the works, uh, Exploring God's House. I'm probably going to title it, which does get into the Hebrew. It has the interlinear. It, so it's it's more of a verse by verse uh, version of that. Um, I just uh, am at the point I need to have that uh, professionally edited yet. But um, but that's it's a different approach altogether in, in that one of them is, is just saying, OK, you're an English speaking person. You trust your English Bible. And I just explain what went wrong as opposed to uh, and, and how it, it pro- probably went wrong um, in, in just simple ways that people can understand. You know, they're, they're, they're these you don't have to be a Hebrew uh, aficionado to to uh, to make sense of this again or an engineer. I mean, it's it's really uh, it's laid out is um I, I think that you don't even have to speak English and you could you could page through this and understand what's what's going on in the, the replacement. So, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. It's uh, beautifully done. And you'll find uh, links in the notes at VFTB.net or wherever you're listening or, or viewing. Uh, the website, again, is project314.org, The House of El Shaddai. Andrew Hoy is the author. Andrew, we'll have to have you back to talk about uh, your next book when uh, when that's ready. All right. That'd be great. Andrew Hoy, The House of El Shaddai. Coming up, two conferences for the price of one. Details on the True Legends virtual conference just a month away. And new dates. New dates for the Skywatch TV tour of Israel. We'll tell you when straight ahead on A View from the Bunker. Unveiling the ancient realms of demonic kings and Satan's battle plan for Armageddon. Skywatch TV is proud to announce two new special offers. The Veneration Collection with optional Red Wing Saga series. Sold separately, this exclusive offer retails for $90. Yours now for only $35 plus shipping and handling. But wait, now you have the option to upgrade and expand your collection by including all five previously released books in the Red Wing Saga. The expanded collection, which includes all eight books and the Search for the Rephaim DVD documentary, holds a retail value of $190. Yours now for your donation of only $100 plus shipping and handling. So don't delay. Order the Veneration Collection with optional Red Wing Saga series now. Available at Skywatch tvstore.com or call 1-844-750-4985. Somewhat live, talking the walk from the beautiful Missouri Ozarks every Sunday night. This is A View from the Bunker, online at vftb.net. Our free mobile app brings these programs right to your smartphone or tablet, available for Android and iOS devices, and links to those app stores at the website, vftb.net, on the social needs, Twitter, at ViewFromBunker, or my personal Twitter handle, at Derek Gilbert. I answer to either one. Facebook, the page is View From the Bunker. You'll also find me on Parlay.com and SaviorConnected.com at Derek P. Gilbert. So take advantage of the free mobile app and uh, keep up to date with what's happening here on the program. What's happening conference-wise? True Legends was originally scheduled for the Mansion Theater in Branson in mid-July because of COVID-19. That's been rescheduled and rethought. It is now a virtual conference, and it's coming in less than a month. May 15th through 17th will be the date when uh, presentations from Steve Quayle, Ellie Marzulli, Dr. Michael Lake, Russ Dizdar, Gary Wayne, Carl Tykrib, Celeste Solom, Bob Griswold, Darren Geisinger, Daniel Holdings, and yours truly will be streaming. I've got my presentation videoed and off to the editor. And uh, so nice to have that done. I think we're going to break some ground with this one. Uh, We've got some... uh, Incredible and jaw-dropping drone footage, thanks to our good friend Aaron Lipkin, and we'll talk more about Aaron in just a moment. Uh, so don't miss it. You get two conferences for the price of one when you sign up for the True Legends Conference in May. You also get access to all of the video presentations from last year's conference, answering the alien question. So you get all of that immediately, and then all of these live as they stream out, and then video on demand afterward. And uh, you'll find all the information at gen6.com. That's G-E-N-S-I-X.com. The True Legends Conference, Ancient Cataclysms and Coming Catastrophes, Pre-Adam, and the Return of the Days of Noah. My presentation is titled, A Rip in the Fabric of Time, Chaos, Leviathan, and the Real War of the Worlds. This is new material that I've not talked about previously, so uh, this will be something brand new. And... uh 
based on research Sharon and I have been doing for a forthcoming project, features some jaw-dropping HD drone video from our friend Aaron Lipkin. And speaking of Lipkin, he is the CEO of uh, Lipkin Tours, and we have agreed to push back the 2020 Skywatch TV Tour of Israel to 2021. Uh, we're going to confirm the exact dates, but it's going to be the second half of April, looks like, uh, from roughly April 15th through May 1st. Schedule will still be the same. The, the one change that we're making, and this was based on feedback from people who expressed an interest in going with us in October. And again, the October tour has been moved back to April of 2021. Um, the extension will be to Jordan rather than to Sardinia. Uh, we had we had thought that uh, we could interest folks in seeing the uh, megalithic sites in Sardinia, and I'm sure that there is an interest there, but that may have to be a separate tour because most of the folks who were planning to come to Israel, if they were interested in the extension and already in Israel, really wanted to go see Jordan. And I can't blame you for that because crossing over the Jordan and seeing the sites in Jordan, specifically Mount Nebo, from which you can see the ancient site of Sodom, and the Valley of the Travelers, prophesied by Ezekiel in Ezekiel 39, plus Petra, which is far more spiritually significant than we were ever taught. Uh, that really is not, you really can't pass that up. So uh, the Skywatch TV tour of Israel, delayed from October, we're going to push that back to next April. Uh, for the latest information, log on to skywatchinisrael.com, skywatchinisrael.com. And again, uh, keep your eyes open for the uh, drone footage supplied by Aaron Lipkin in my presentation at the True Legends Conference coming up. So, we appreciate you listening. However you consume this podcast, please leave a review for us. Uh, Spreaker, Stitcher, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, wherever else you find us, which is, of course, wherever fine podcasts are sold. Or give us a like on Facebook, The View from the Bunker page there. A View from the Bunker is a production of Gilbert House, released under Creative Commons, attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 4.0 international license. Our opening theme is Iron Bacon by Kevin McLeod, www.incompetech.com. Our announcer is DC Good. Please remember, check out our other podcasts, PID Radio, and our weekly Bible study, the Gilbert House Fellowship at Gilbert house.org that's gilberthouse.org we wrestle not against flesh and blood next week evangelist stephen wright joins us from northern ireland until then thanks for listening i'm Derek gilbert and this is a view from the bunker <laughs>